Welcome to another episode of the News Roundup. On today's show, we're going to talk about the skyrocketing cases of COVID-19 in China, and more specifically, the horrors inflicted on the citizens of Shanghai in the government's bid to quell the pathogen. We're going to discuss what is going on here. And so, from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode starts now. So earlier this month, we here at Trial Site News reported on a record SARS-CoV-2 surge of clusters in China, which included the most afflicted area of Shanghai, which happens to be one of the largest cities in the world with about 26 million people living there. China, which has prided itself on its ability to keep COVID-19 in check due to a combination of zero-tolerance COVID-19 policy and its mass vaccination scheme, which has led this nation to be one of the most vaccinated countries on the planet. However, despite this, cases have skyrocketed, approaching 25,000 new infections per day, with provincial and municipal governments employing grossly oppressive authoritarian measures against its own people. The entire city of Shanghai's 26 million people have been in lockdown for three weeks now, with mounting food shortages and growing clashes with authorities, as the government there has instituted horrific methods of forcing its citizens to comply. In what observers in Shanghai have called a cruel lockdown, with most of the city residents literally locked in their own homes, CNN's David Culver reported just a few days ago that government workers there have used padlocks and bicycle locks to lock people in their own homes. And this includes his own. And so questions, of course, have followed. What if someone needs to go buy food? What about a physician's appointment? Well, apparently they're just out of luck, unless one has the economic wherewithal to find loopholes within this inhumane lockdown. Inside Edition reports that the draconian measures are enforced by what is being called the Big Whites, or armies of men in white hazmat suits, and what could be a scene directly out of the Squid Games show. The British press reports horrific videos of police brutality, restraining protesters who are attempting to resist the brutal lockdown. And according to the UK's Daily Mail, some Chinese citizens have had enough, as the men in white hazmat suits show up along with the police, homeowners and apartment dwellers are fighting back, trying to thwart attempts to transform their homes into an isolation center. But sadly, that's not all. The local government there have set up cramped super spreader centers in vacant offices with people crammed into them, oftentimes ill, and food shortages have been reported. And at night, millions of people are heard shrieking out of their windows in what represents a desperate mass human call for help. Watching these videos, hearing people's cries for help in a city that feels dead, it really does bring out the horror in the situation. China's population most certainly has put up with a lot for their purported prosperity brought to them by the Chinese Communist Party. More and more it seems that China's top tier of government, with its dangerous top-down corporate totalitarian regime controlled by one man, President Xi Jinping, is resembling the Stalinist model of communism, with aspects of Hitler's Germany or Mussolini's Italy. The fear amongst the average citizen, crushed by their rulers in China, is palpable. Shanghai's rich, however, are living fabulously well, while its large working poor community struggles more by the day, suffering immeasurably more with these brutal lockdowns since late March. Even the Chinese press acknowledges the ever-widening gulf between the haves and have-nots in China, as it becomes ever more apparent for all to see. Frank Tang, reporting for the South China Morning Post, wrote that this pandemic has accelerated the socio-economic class divisions in Chinese society, while flat and apartment ownership by the wealthy is used as cash cows, exploiting renters who pay ever larger amounts of their dwindling income on an average of 4,000 per year for the bottom 50% of Chinese society. Daniel O'Connor, founder of Trial Site News, talked about this. He said that we have spoken with a few business colleagues in China that report that the top 10% are exploiting flat and apartment ownership to squeeze as much cash flow as possible to support their extravagant lifestyles. This is in part because of capital controls on external investment. 
Meanwhile, we have reports from physicians that wish to remain anonymous that China's health insurance only goes so far. The poor in both urban and rural areas often face mounting challenges within some cases of basic health access, and God forbid, any emergencies. If you don't have the economic means, you can be out of luck. An example of this would be a doctor investigator within the Trial Site News Network who spoke with us on condition of anonymity, saying that if you don't have money in some areas with some hospitals and some life-threatening disease strikes you, you are out of luck. When asked what he meant by that, he simply said, they are left to die. And so it seems that even the more market-driven USA has more social safety nets than the biggest communist country in the world. But authoritarian flirtations are alive and well here in the West, albeit not yet nearly as extreme. For now. An example of what I mean by this is here in the West, in Canada, Justin Trudeau's actions using the never-before-used Emergencies Act, granting him special authority to restrict movement of Canadian citizens, or freeze financial accounts, or directing citizens to do certain actions that perhaps they don't want to do, such as the forced towing of trucks. Or we can look at here in the US, where President Biden used the pandemic emergency to justify mass censorship, top-down government overreaches of healthcare, and other ideological and partisan power plays. The Hill, for example, showcased Biden's latest power grab, accumulating unprecedented economic power in the economic branch of government. As The Hill put it, Acting with bipartisan support, President Biden has invoked a 72-year-old law, the Defense Production Act, to increase domestic production of the minerals used to make electric vehicle batteries. Through this action, Biden has sent a worrisome precedent that places massive economic power in the executive branch by classifying a civilian nicety as a national defense mandate. While Congress has previously acted to stretch the law by expanding national defense to include terrorist attacks and pandemics, President Biden's actions stretches a power beyond what should be its breaking point. Meanwhile, Russia's Vladimir Putin demonstrated in real time the brutal costs of fascistic-leaning rule. He showed what an authoritarian regime is capable of doing quickly with the invasion and slaughter of innocent civilians in Ukraine. The escalating contradictions of China's purported communist society are on full display in its greatest city, with brutal government suppression of its own people, treating them like criminals, or perhaps worse, less than human, all in a bid to avoid the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen. Which in truth is a tragedy, as the Chinese civilization, what with the longest continuous history of any country in the world over 3,500 years, whose people have been known for their industrious and enterprising ways, only to be crushed underfoot by those ruling over them. A warning, my friends, if there ever was one for the free people of the West. And that, my friends, brings our episode to a close once more. As always, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all 